Tonight, we are about to discuss the tree of life. A tree has roots, trunk, branches, and stature. Many years ago, when the Master Jesus walked upon earth, he anointed a man's eyes that were blind. And when he anointed those eyes, the man spoke and said, I see men as trees walking. This enigmatic statement has often seemed to puzzle many. Because we find the master anointed his eyes again. And this time he said, now I see all things clearly. Therefore denoting, of course, that he was not seeing clearly under the former condition of seeing men as trees walking. But in effect, such things are true viewed from certain planes. For man is a tree planted beside a beautiful, calm sea by living waters. Because man has roots, roots are source, and source is the creator, or God, call him any other name, a rose known by any other name smells as sweet. So our tree has a source into which to plunge the roots of its being. And that tree is, of course, God. Therefore, the growth of that tree is an ongoing factor. We draw the nutrients for our growth all through the roots. However, as the tree pushes above ground, and its branches rise, as the trunk rises and the branches with it, we perceive that a certain amount of ingestion of oxygen, of air, occurs through the branches themselves. And so we find in this world that just as we receive much from deity, so we also are subjected to our environment, in this case, the surrounding atmosphere. Man, however, as a tree, does not always grow or expand to the same height. Some are taller physically, some are shorter, some are taller spiritually. We find that people stand at different heights in their development at a given time. The old story of the tortoise and the hare is one we're familiar with. We recognize sometimes in fable that these things occur, but we do not recognize the fact that people sometimes stand spiritually tall and others stand spiritually short. There is a tendency sometimes for the tall one to think, unfortunately, that by reason of his height, by reason of his advancement or his knowledge, that he might be just a little better than the other, but who knows how long the tree has been planted. Some of us may have been planted a few years ago, and some may have been planted a few thousands of years ago, because we have to recognize several factors. We need to recognize the fact that some people do not take advantage of the evolutionary potential, of the evolutionary possibilities that they have. And whereas this is a simple fact, it is the cause of a great deal of individual as well as collective distress in the world. I think that the 
more spiritual a person really becomes, the more humble they become. And I feel today, and I submit to you all, that egoism and vanity indicate either a young soul, young in development, who does not understand the nature of growth from the source, or else is rebellious and recalcitrant withal. In other words, the individual does not see that his greatest hopes lie in humility, not toward God, because God cannot be fooled, but toward his fellow man. We need humility toward one another. It should be genuine and instantaneous. It should be spontaneous, completely so. It should burst forth from our being. Any other condition is indicative of what has been called by our psychology an inferiority complex. Because people feel inferior, they often revert to playing a role that they do not have. But in reality, the playing of this role does not exalt us at all. Rather, it prevents our clear seeing of the mystery of the tree of life. For the tree of life should go directly to the source, that it may expand and grow. This is what we should do. We should not become parasites upon one another dependent upon one another, even for spiritual fire. Many years ago, I heard a very orthodox minister proclaim that many people love to toast their shins, as he put it, on someone else's fires. Of course, this goes without saying. Are not all of you more comfortable with a positive state of mind with someone that exudes the process called hope than you would be with someone who is the harbinger of despair, the bearer of doom and tidings of gloom. When you see people that convey gloom and doom, you just can't help it. You'd like to get away a bit. But when you see someone that exudes hope, that believes in a brighter tomorrow, not only for themselves, but for you and the world, someone who works constructively. These are the people that are sought out not only in the religious field, but even in the field of show business, in the field of success in the business world, even among the farmers who raise our crops and who feed this great nation. Everyone loves to be around someone who can think positively, and who can exude that feeling and create it in others. So when we consider the meaning of the tree of life and we consider going back to the root source, to our God presence, to our divinity, we should make sure that we realize we are paying homage to the divinity in the best way possible when we have the right attitude of thought. Why, I'm connected with God. Think of it. I'm connected with God. You say that about yourself right while I'm talking now. Just say it and, and realize it. Realize that you are connected with God. And it changes the whole matter. Because after all, things can't be too bad if you're connected with God. Well, the whole question then becomes one of being connected with God in a determinate effort to maintain that in the face of all conditions to the contrary. Now, the tree of life is more than just a symbol. It is a definite pattern of our connection. The real tree of life that stands in the midst of the garden of God is your great causal body. Your causal body with its concentric color rings. Because there is where you each one lay up 
in store for yourself treasures in heaven that cannot be taken from you. We deposit in the local 6% bank and it could collapse. We trust in the security system that ensures up to $20,000 deposited in one bank under one individual account. But the federal deposit insurance system could fail. After all, even our government could fail. Whether we realize it or not, we have already failed monetarily in the sense that the person who started to save many, many years ago for their old age now finds that even if they had $100,000 saved, that that is in effect through purchasing power, failures of purchasing power because of price increases, that that probably has no more than $50,000 worth of purchasing power. So we have seen that the moth and the rust and all of these conditions can break through and steal the things in this world that we place our store by, the things that we believe in that do not necessarily support our belief. But when we think of the causal body, let us examine it a little more. In the center of the causal body, and incidentally, in reality, there are 12 rings to the causal body, to our great tree of life. 12 rings, and the 12 manner of fruits that shall be for the healing of the nations. Because what heals the nations will also heal us individually. So let's go to the very center, and what do you find at the center but the white fire core of our great trunk of the tree of life? What is stored there? A nothing except purity. Purity as it manifests from the divinity of God. Divine purity is what is stored there. But someone may say, I'm not pure. I've done wrong, or I've thought wrong, or I've said wrong. Well, surely each man ought to know that the opportunities for life here were given to us to exercise our free will. We were not born into a perfect world. I found that out when I was driving along in the streetcar at the age of three. I was on the way 12 miles away from my hometown and all at once that trolley pole that sticks up and rides the track, you know, the, the wire, it fell down in the middle of the night when we were driving along, my father and mother and I. It fell down with a terrible crash and the heat quit in the car and the lights failed in the car and we weren't going anywhere. So we had to get out one cold night and we had to walk across the field through a farmer's yard to the bus line where buses picked all of the streetcar passengers up. And that, of course, was the beginning of the end for the streetcar. It was a simple mishap. It happens all the time, but still that was a big problem. So we have to realize that we need and require knowledge and understanding of what is behind the idea of purity but forgiveness. We need to have forgiveness. It is essential. We need to have forgiveness for our neighbors, for our friends, for our enemies. We need to accept forgiveness for ourselves. One of the greatest causes of problems in the world today is permanent condemnation. This is the cause of cancer. Now, this doesn't mean that everybody that has cancer or had cancer is of necessity practicing condemnation at the time that they have it. I understand the late Ramakrishna, for example, died of cancer of the throat. So that doesn't mean that he necessarily hated. But the root causes behind cancer are hatred. 
hatred of one cell by another, which causes cannibalism in the cell. And then, through the hereditary factor being active in people whose families have had a history of it, there is generally a greater tendency to manifest this, providing they do not exhibit the qualities of love. So, purity through forgiveness, the catharsis of forgiveness, is an essential quality that everyone needs. If you are unhappy when you're alone, if when you go to bed at night, you fret and you stew, about events that happened to you. What happened at the butcher shop or the bakery? Whatever happened to you during that day, whatever may have happened, if you were at a club and maybe some lady in that club looked at you in a manner that led you to believe that she was talking about you. She wasn't overly friendly. And so you go back home at night and you begin to say, I wonder what Addie had in her mind. And uh, all night long you keep revolving this and you don't sleep very well. You toss and you turn and you upset your entire body chemistry. You let somebody pull your chain, in other words, and you go down the drain with it. <laughs> that happens. And when it happens, no good thing comes of it at all. But oh, so much good would come of purity, the purity of God. If you would go off and say, well, I don't care what anybody's saying. When they're talking about me, they're leaving the rest of the world alone. And, uh, and something like that, and just laugh about it, but do your protection, because uh, you know that statement of Jesus. He says, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. So if somebody has a lot of wrath toward you, and in the old Egyptian way, they send the Ka out after you, because during the night, the wrath intensifies because they programmed it that way, and they never, never realized in many cases what they're doing. Many times people do not realize what they're doing. They innocently enough practice black magic, in effect simply by hating people and letting the sun go down on their wrath. And as the sun goes down on their wrath, the Ka becomes vicious because it was programmed so. So it goes forth and attacks the other individual. Sometimes it may wake them up as in a nightmare. At other times it may just wake them up. But nevertheless, it can be protected against through doing your prayers to your presence, invoking your tube of light, and keeping purity within your thoughts. Purity is a very important part of the Godhead of the tree of life. And that you find right in here. Then comes illumination. I don't have to tell you the value people place upon education. Secular education is considered extremely valuable. If you want to go ahead and really make a community angry, all you do is tell them that their children are not going to get what they're entitled to in the form of education. And believe me, this will incense an entire community. Or tell them, for example, that their children are getting something, but they're not getting nearly as much as someone else is over here. And right away, people do not like it. They are very much concerned with education. And how long does that education last? I don't have to tell you that after you go through school, you start to use a great deal of the things you've learned in school, but many of them you never use. And uh, you don't even uh, stop to consider some ideas again through your whole life. And therefore you forget them. And you begin to wonder why you ever learned them. But of course it was a process. And your ability to assimilate this knowledge has been of help to you. And you're able to assimilate now many other things. So it is not really useless. But this is secular education we're speaking of, and secular education has its value. But let us stop for a moment and consider as to whether or not secular education provides all the answers we need to go through life victoriously. And I'm sure that you will answer this question by saying, of course not. You will recognize that it does not. And so spiritual knowledge is important. 
As a rule, you do not learn in the school system too much, at least you didn't when I went to school, about extrasensory perception. You do not learn how to release your thoughts into the atmosphere to another. You don't learn how to become receptive to the thoughts of God. There's nobody really tells you that. Some people talk about creative energy. They talk about God as the creator, but they don't call him God. They say creative energy. I'm going to get some assistance, some knowledge from creative energy. And so people become inspired to write great pieces of music, or they become inspired to perform great works of art, or they learn to do other tasks that are very useful to our society. So we come to the conclusion that genius is not all a matter of secular knowledge, but of that which is locked within our individual hearts. And we begin to realize that by tapping the ray of purity and then going forth the next step to the ray of illumination, we are able to receive from God or be God taught ourselves. And this is very much like what happened to Jacob Behman. How many of you have ever heard of him? He's one that's referred to in the book on cosmic consciousness by Richard Maurice Buck. Dr. Buck was superintendent of the London, Ontario Asylum for the Insane for many, many years, and he made a great study of alienation, a great study of the human mind. And in the course of his discoveries, his spiritual interests took him into the field of examining the attributes of highly evolved spiritual people. And so he reports in his book on many such people. We come to realize then that humble people, people who are not of any necessity have any degree at all, can receive enormous uh, tides of illumination in their consciousness. And so they can receive that illumination that we think of as emanating from the second ray or the second ring of our tree of life. So you see, the tree of life is the causal body because it is the permanent tree. It is really not the tree, it is not a deciduous tree. We're thinking of it more in terms of being a lone pine on a high, high hill. We think of it as towering and pointing the way to heaven, the way to God. And so our tree of life is a living tree because it has Christ roots and it draws up the beautiful, bountiful sap through the trunk from the root structure. And the root structure is embedded in God. Now this is not a bad thing. Because you see the giant redwoods up in California, here, up in the northern part of California, they are huge, and they point the way too. And in a sense, our soul is a giant also. Our causal body is a giant also. And our causal body points the way to God. It is the tree of life. And the qualities of that tree are a part of our natural endowment, a part of our natural unfoldment. It is just as much yours as it is mine. And no man or woman need be denied this tree of life because this is part of the content of the individual, of the monadic expression. So we go on and we come to the pink which is a wealth of love. I don't know if it was Pearl Buck or who it was that said it, but life is a many splendored thing. Love is a many splendored thing. And so I am sure that many of you have different concepts of love. Some think that love is purely the handling of substance or a closeness to an individual. When you understand love properly, you can be as close to anyone as you could ever be to anyone, even yourself, just through the processes of God. You do not have to have 
a physical contact, a physical contact with a human being just through a handshake, an embrace, or something of that nature in order to have the greatest of closenesses to that being. Now then, there are other types of love. We're all familiar, I'm sure, with conjugal love. We recognize physical love and its aspects. This can be two of many types. It can be meaningful in the sense that it has other endowments and attributes that are involved with it. Or it can be pure lust and animalism. So you see, there are many types of love and this is not the type of love that we're thinking of when we're thinking of the tree of life. Because our tree of life is thinking about divine love. Most human love is selfish. I think most of you realize that if whatever quality endears you to another were taken from you, for example, if someone lost their beauty through the throwing of a acid, we shall say, in their face, and so all of their beauty was wiped out, and they were that hideous thing which God forbid. But if this were to happen to a person, someone who is married to them or their sweetheart, might no longer care for them because their beauty would have vanished. The appearance world would now be different. And so we must realize and we ought to think about this. We ought to understand that love ought not to be something that we lavish on the object of our affection because it gives us some satisfaction. This is selfish love. Unselfish love will take the bitter with the sweet. Unselfish love is the greatest love because it recognizes the power of things to change. Things may change. In fact, they will. As Sir Thomas More during that embodiment, as Thomas More wrote in that beautiful song, Believe Me If All Those Endearing Young Charms. For he wrote that song under the impetus of his wife's attack of smallpox. Smallpox was a terrible scavenger in those days. It ravaged the physical face of people, both men and women, and left them horribly pitted and scarred beyond description. Sometimes it took their life and snuffed it out. She had passed through the danger and crisis. And now she, who was an actress upon the London theater, on the boards, she was now hideous to herself when she looked in the mirror. And she said to him, I will never leave my room again. And he sang this song to her. Believe me, if all those endearing young charms which I gaze on so fondly today, were to fade by tomorrow and fade in my arms like fairy gifts fading away, thou would still be adored as this moment thou art. Let thy loveliness fade as it will, and around the dear ruin each wish of my heart would entwine itself lovingly still. And when she heard it, she answered and said, Thomas, I'm coming down. And so she resumed her role among mankind because she realized she had the greatest treasure in the world, the love that was beyond just physical satisfaction or physical appearance, the love that was genuine, which all of us would well do to cultivate because when we cultivate it, we draw it forth from God. He created all things, he saw all things, and he said, they were good. With this thought of goodness in his mind, he endowed us liberally with every gracious gift and every gracious potential that our age and past ages have hidden from view. Many of these virtues is not the fault of divinity, but rather our fault. One we can rectify, one that will give hope to ourselves as it will to the whole world. 
For our destiny is not in a moment. Our destiny is not just tonight. Our destiny is an ongoingness. It is an awakening and a shaking of our consciousness that the ashes, the pitiful ashes of our past that has been burned up without accomplishment be shook out and that we determine to replace it by a greater use of the wondrous qualities of life. We come then through the violet transmuting flame, through the ordered service, through diplomacy, uh, through the healing green, and through the power of the blue. And we go on until we finish the 12 concentric rings of the tree of life. And when the whole tree, both these, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and the five hidden qualities of the tree of life are ours, we then have the complete repertoire, the complete furnishings of our tree and its concentric rings that will lead us all the way to the Godhead. By rights, I was supposed to finish five minutes ago. Obviously, I will finish soon because we're now pointing the way to the Godhead. And that is what I want to impress upon all of you. Just as the higher you rise in spiritual values and their interpretation, so the more humble you will become within yourself. So when you go back to the Godhead, you will find no desire that may be called an aggrandizement of any part of the universe, but you will find rather the cup of fulfillment. You will find in the Godhead a desire to fulfill his ideal, to fulfill the dreams of God, and these are contributory dreams. Most individuals are not aware of the fact of the largeness of the universe. Oh, they take lessons in astronomy. They see these astronomical uh, distances of light years in space, but they are literally meaningless to most of us. And why is this so? Because from a relative sense, there is little true mental or spiritual grasp in the mind of the average person. There is little upon which we can hinge a comparison. I have seen a book that I thought was rather clever where a little girl was sitting in a courtyard in Holland and then it showed where they went above the house and looked down and you saw her sitting in the chair there in Holland. You saw the neighborhood. And then they had another fly leaf and you turned another page and there uh, you saw the entire city and you could still see the remnant of this little chair and this little house. And then it took in all of Holland. And then it took in all of Europe. And then it took in all of the hemisphere. And then it took in the entire planet. And then it went on and viewed it from the moon. And on and on through space to try to give you some idea of how vast space really was. And then it went downward, as I recall. But in any case, it was showing the relative size of these various objects. Well, size is meaningless in this sense, that if you and I and this house and all of Santa Barbara were perched on the head of a pin, or perhaps we might want to say, maybe say something like a mushroom, it wouldn't make any difference, but even on the head of a pin, if that's where we were perched, and we were all of relative size to what we are now, would it really make any difference? If the whole cosmos that we know now was also on that pin and we were in it, would it really make any difference? You see, we can think this way on one hand and on the other, we can imagine ourselves to have a head just as large as this town. You think our thoughts would be seen inside that head running around? You see what I mean? If things are all relative and everyone else is correspondingly the same size, 
it wouldn't make any difference. So we have to realize that in God, size is very unimportant, just as time and space. This, this eliminates space in a way. Space is not too important. It's how we use space. As one of the great masters said, we should learn to hallow space. The hallowing of space is done by the projection of our thoughts and our feelings. You just go ahead sometime, you sit on the corner, and you think. You're sitting there in the corner, and you think, why, God is here. God's in me, and he's out there in that corner. But I know most people don't pay any attention to God being here. So what I'm going to do right now, I'm going to just gild all these stones with pure gold, spiritual gold. You go ahead and be your own Walt Disney. Create your own fairyland around that corner. You just sit there a little while. I don't want you to go crazy doing this. <laughs> Disney wasn't crazy, and you don't have to be either. We like our people to have their feet on the ground, but we want you also to know the powers of which you are endowed. You can draw people to places this way. You can just think of thoughts of beauty and build them into solidity until they become magnetic and watch the people flow. This is really a fulfillment of Jesus' statement. And I, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. Because what are you doing? You are lifting him up by using him. Oh, they won't tell you this. If you're a Jesuit, or even if you're a non-Jesuit, they aren't going to tell you this. If you go to some Sunday school, they won't teach you this. They might even call it black magic or witchcraft or some horrible thing. They think it was terrible that a man should even talk about the fact that he can endow a street corner or himself or an organization or the world with qualities that are bubbling over with God. Because people today in our world do not understand and do not realize what they have within them. And they are afraid to use their power. A lot of times they think in terms of the sorcerer's apprentice. You remember the sorcerer's apprentice? How a little fellow never could get out of the big sorcerer how to perform the magic trick of drawing water up with his broomstick and so when the big sorcerer went away, he dug up one of his magic books and he found the formula to make the broom active. And so the broom runs around and starts filling the room with water. And when the sorcerer returns, everything and everybody is floating, including the little sorcerer's apprentice. So he has to banish it all. We should understand and recognize that there are foolish things that people think about life things that have no value, but the healing of disease is valid. The cleansing of the consciousness is valid. And if you really want to know, if you'll go down the pattern of this, of your tree of life, if you'll go down that pattern and precipitate, and I'm not talking about sorcery, but I'm talking about going back to the source. You understand what I mean now? You know, sorcery in most people today, that is horrible. And in an awful lot of people, it is. But the right kind of sorcery, which is spelled S-O-U-R-C-E, source, and then E-R-Y afterward, going back to God and using God's power correctly, this is very, very, very valid. It is the restoration of your tree of life to its proper place because it is, quote, in the midst of the garden of God. And that's where you find it in the midst of God's garden. It's part of the paradise creation. As it is now, you get chased around a bit. Why do you get chased around? Because you've got all kinds of people misqualified. You have people all over this city, all over the city I came from, all over Los Angeles and San Francisco and all over the face of this green earth, just busy, busy, busy misqualified. Oh, they hate this and they hate that. And they hope this person dies and that person dies and they blame the president and they blame the Congress and they blame some other country. They'll say they blame the Jews and they blame the Gentiles and there's blame flowing back and forth. 
Or it's the unions that's doing it all. You know, it's the unions. Or it might be those awful motion pictures. Well, if they never went to see any of them, they'd soon fold, wouldn't they? But the whole idea is it's always something and somebody and all kinds of energy is tied up in hate and hate creations. And floating around in all of this, what do you find? You find people, people like you and I, and people like them, the ones out there who have no idea what it's all about, and they are the victims of this, and the tree of life has no meaning to them. Now, if you take a hold of this teaching and use it correctly, your life will change. I will not give you a promise that can't be fulfilled. I'm giving you a promise that will be fulfilled. God said so, Christ said so, the masters say so, and we say so from the realm of experimentation. We have experimented with it. Today, we don't want to inundate the whole world suddenly with the Summit Lighthouse prematurely. Because the Summit Lighthouse is a mere cup. It's a vehicle. What is poured into that cup is the water of life. And what is poured into you is the water of life. And what's really going to change you, what's really going to alchemize you, really build you up into a different person, the power of change, is inherent within the teachings. And I don't care how long you've heard about them because you haven't been here long enough to have wore them out. Even by attempting to use them. And quite a few of you have used them successfully. But you can be more successful. I can be more successful. We can all be more successful. And as we become more successful, we will precipitate the kingdom of heaven. A better world will appear. It has to work. It's just a lack of faith. Christianity had the ball once. They were running with it down toward the goalposts, very greatly, doing a beautiful job of it. Somebody said, if we can't lick them, let's join them. And they took them down for the long count. And they've been going down ever since. But they've done a lot of good even in the falling down. But it took our present age of young people to spy it out, to recognize the hypocrisy which was very self-apparent, even when I was a boy. I just didn't dare to say anything about it. I got my face slapped if I did. But the point is, it's not really anybody's fault. Christianity, Buddhism, any of the religions of the world, all of these religions have a purpose and had a purpose. They've accomplished something in the past. They've helped mankind to come out of the dark. It was the Christ in all of them that really was helpful. We read in the Greek, the Christos. The Christos. What is the Christos but light? And what is light but that which is to be found everywhere upon earth? I can assure you that if our world were completely dark, we couldn't even live in it. So there has to be light, and there has been light throughout the ages. The light, however, has been superimposed upon darkness. And Jesus himself said something so interesting. He said, if the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? You can take that many ways. You can take it as if he said, how great is that darkness? Well, it isn't very great. But you know a little better than that, because he says, if it is darkness, so you can take it, if that light which is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness because you allow it to be great, don't you see? You permit it to be great within you. You don't have to do that. You don't have to permit darkness to be great. There's nothing wrong in a person having the ability to detect it. One of the early gifts in the early Christian church, the very great gift of the Holy Spirit was, the gift of discerning of spirits. I have had that gift by God's grace since I was 15 years old and many others. But it was God who gave it to me. I'm sure some of you also have this gift. You look at someone and you know exactly what they are. But don't forget that they change. When I look at any man or woman in whom I perceive a lesser quality, I see also a change 
taking place within me. I see them made more luminous, more glorious, more divine, because thus we carry them forth. If we don't, God help us, because this is all the people you are probably going to ever contact in this world. I'm referring to the whole people of the world. This is your generation. New ones will come and old ones will go. But in effect, this is your generation. It's not going to get any better or any worse unless people contribute to its downfall. As the late Khalil Gibran, the man from Lebanon, said, you cannot rise any higher than the highest in all of you or fall any lower than the lowest in all of you. We should recognize then that it is in potential that we rise and in potential that we fall. I think the great sin facing all mankind is the fact that they can even conceive of themselves as falling. The cleverest thing, the most godly thing that any man can do, the most Christ-like act, is to decide that I cannot go back and I will ever go forward. Because then you will be flowing with the universe and you will at last water your tree of life and bring forth the promised land right where you are. Thank you and God bless. Thank you very much. We'll release that to God. <laughs>